Hello, I'm Casey, and it's my pleasure to welcome you back to Prophecies of Hope. We have a couple of things that we want to announce tonight, things that you need to know. But first, as usual, I'd like to issue a special welcome to a couple of areas. Now, we've been welcoming those from North Carolina and South Carolina, various cities in the area. But I'd like to acknowledge a couple of areas that are not in the Carolinas. For those of you watching from Florida and Michigan, two fairly opposite climates, we like to welcome you tonight especially. And we're grateful that you're here wherever you're joining us from. But especially those two places tonight, we want to acknowledge you. And thank you for being here, a part of this journey through scripture that we're taking together. Now to those announcements we talked about. Tomorrow at 11, 11 a.m., Steve will be giving another presentation. He's going to continue this journey through prophecy, this journey through Daniel and Revelation. And we decided to have more, if you've looked at the schedule, you'll see it, so that we can get a little deeper into prophecy, so we can understand more and build on the knowledge that we already have. So I encourage you, tomorrow is a continuation of this series. Please join us right back here at 11. And we will also be back again at seven. So just to clarify, tomorrow we have two presentations, one at 11 and one at seven. The other two announcements you're probably tired of hearing, but I think I'm gonna say them again. If you have a question for Steve, please feel free to submit that in the ask a question button at the lower left hand side of your screen. Steve is excited to continue answering questions and the ones we've gotten so far are really good questions. So please be encouraged. We want to hear your questions. We want to answer them. And last, one of the questions that we've gotten is how can I watch previous meetings or previous seminar sessions? You can do that by logging into our website and then going to the drop down menu under your name and there you should find all of the previous sessions and you can watch them, review them, whatever you would like to do there. We're glad to have those available to you. And, and another thing that we need you to know as well is that we're going to continue through this series but we are halfway, we're two weeks in. So we're glad that you've been with us whether this is your first time or however many times you've come, we're glad that you're with us this evening. Now, tonight's message is something Steve is deeply passionate about. It's the sign of revelation and the end of time. It's the thing that matters. It's the sign that delineates God's people. So, Steve, I'm excited to hear about it. We thank you for your presence. We thank you for the Holy Spirit. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that you will draw very close to us tonight as we study this exciting subject. In Jesus' precious name, we thank you. Amen. In 1991, the cosmic background explorer called the COBE satellite began sending back information to the Earth that caused a sensation in the scientific circles. The data it sent back tended to prove that the universe did indeed have a beginning. Now, this is important because some people's picture of this vast universe that's around us leaves no room for God. They believe that, there's a, that, that there can't be a personal creator behind all of this. When people take God out of the picture, they simply say, the universe has always been there, it's eternal, and that's their starting point. The basic question of origins doesn't leave many alternatives. You start with God or you simply start with matter. Either of which has always been there in the minds of people. But the Kobe Project shows that the universe hasn't always been there. As one Berkeley astronomer put it, what we have found is the evidence of the birth of the universe. It's like looking at God. This recent scientific data does point in the direction of a creator God. 
Now, in the Bible's last book, and you know what book that is, it's the book of Revelation, God is on center stage as the creator of the universe. Now, in just a moment, we're going to turn to the pages of Revelation, but imagine you having the same experience that John the Revelator had. John was caught up in vision to an amazing scene in heaven's throne room. It was as though John was standing before the throne of God. What he saw was so dazzling as to be almost beyond description. Something you'd only see in your wildest dreams. It was a scene of joyful, and I want to underscore this word, worship. Worship. Now, let's turn to the book of Revelation. We're going to go to chapter 4 and verse 1. Now, notice what the voice says to John. Come up here. And I will show you things which must take place after this. Now, in verse 8, we find that John, in vision, sees a beautiful scene. He sees all the angelic hosts there. He sees the 24 elders there. He sees the joy and the happiness taking place, and he hears. And here's what he hears. Holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. So John sees this beautiful picture of worship, ladies and gentlemen. All the heavenly host worshiping the God of heaven. As you move through the book of Revelation over and over and over again, you find worship. Worshiping the God of heaven. That is the key. Worshiping the creator God. Now, if you have your Bibles out and you're following along, or you can look at it on the screen, Revelation chapter 4 and verse 11. A powerful Bible verse. You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. Now that, that is an amazing Bible verse. It clearly tells us how everything came into existence through the hand of God. Now let's add Revelation chapter 10 and verse 6. He who lives forever and ever who created heaven and the things that are in it, the earth and the things that are in it, and the sea and the things that are there in it. The Bible is crystal clear. There is no question at all, ladies and gentlemen, that there is a creator God. And if you're going to follow the Bible, there is no room for theistic evolution. There's no room for evolution. There is no room for anything but that God created this planet. He spoke and it came into existence. Now, I do understand that there are many theories out there today about how this planet came into existence. In fact, you've heard of Charles Darwin. He promoted a radically different view of creation. He wrote a book called The Origins of Species. In his volume, he brought out that man evolved. You see... Darwin's theory of evolution came along and suddenly God no longer seemed necessary. Up to that time, people believed in a creator God. But all of a sudden now, they were questioning. But as we continue to study, we will find that God calls for us to worship him as the creator. Now think about it, ladies and gentlemen. It wasn't that long ago we studied about the origin of evil between good and evil. We talked about how there was a cosmic conflict that took place in heaven. And that Lucifer 
became the devil. He willed to sin. He chose to go in the opposite direction of God. He allowed himself to become dissatisfied in heaven. And this great cosmic conflict that began in heaven ended up right here on this planet. We've looked at the story of how it happened, Adam and Eve, and how they said yes to Lucifer, and sin invaded this planet. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I want you to think for just a second. If you were the devil, wouldn't it be masterful for you to have the inhabitants of the planet believe that there is no creator God and, and that we came through a process of evolution? Because you see, if you do not know where you came from, you will not know where you are going. And ladies and gentlemen, if there is one thing that we can clearly see in this great cosmic conflict, this great controversy between good and evil is that Lucifer hates the Creator God. And he does not want us to know and understand where we came from. And by the way, the very power that spoke this planet into existence is the same power that God uses to change our lives. He takes us from chaos. He takes us from darkness. He takes us, ladies and gentlemen, from a place of lostness into his loving arms and he changes and he transforms our lives. So you see, God's creative power is very important. It is very important for us to know exactly where we came from and to believe what the Bible says about creation. Because, ladies and gentlemen, God is in the business also. Christ is in the business of recreation, making us new in Christ Jesus. Now, let's turn to Revelation chapter 14 and verse 7. Remember, three dynamic messages before Jesus comes. We've talked about this a lot. First angel, second angel, third angel, two groups of people, the saved and the lost, and the coming of Christ. So ladies and gentlemen, notice part of the first angel's message. It says, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come, or has come. Now we've talked about that. And then it goes on to say, and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea, and the springs of water. Now, this is a very interesting thought that is conveyed here. Worship him who made, creator, heaven and earth, the sea, and the springs of water. Now, this raises an interesting question. How do we worship the creator of heaven and earth? Has he left us an eternal symbol of his creative power? A sign of true worship in this age of evolution. Well, let's see what the Bible says. Let's go back to the book of beginnings. Let us go to Genesis chapter 2 and verse 1. Notice what the Bible writer says. Thus the heavens and the earth and all the host of them were finished. Now, I want to go to Psalms 33, 9 for just a second. We're going to come back to Genesis. I want to, I want to add a little bit in here so that we get a clear picture of what happened in the book of Genesis. Notice what the psalmist says. For he spoke and it was what, ladies and gentlemen? Done. He commanded and it stood fast. Wow. Wow. Now let's go back to Genesis chapter 2, and we're going to look at verse 2. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all the work which he had done. Now, 
Let me add another verse here that'll clarify and help us understand exactly what's going on in Genesis chapter 2. In Psalms 40 and verse 28, a question is asked, Have you not heard the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is what? Weary. Now that's interesting. Right here in Psalms chapter 40, the Bible says that God doesn't get weary. And yet, in Genesis chapter 2, it tells us that He creates a day out of the fabric of time, 24 hours, that He set aside so that He could rest. And of course, Adam and Eve would rest also. Now, since the Bible says that God does not weary... He is not tired. Why would he place within the fabric of time a day that is set aside for rest? Let's go back to Genesis chapter 2 and verse 3. Then God blessed the seventh day and he sanctified it because in it he rested from all his work which God had created and made. That was interesting. Let's pause here for just a second. I want you to notice three things that happen here in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 3. The seventh day, the Bible says that God blessed it. He set it apart. 24 hours, and he put a blessing upon it. Number two, it says that God sanctified it. Sanctified means set apart for holy use. And then it says that God rested on it. Now, I know what some of you are thinking right now. He had to be tired. I know you read the verse there in Psalm, Steve, but he had to be tired planting all those big trees and digging all those, those lakes and, and oceans. Ladies and gentlemen, no. He was taking in his creation week, and he crowns that creation week with a day that would be the memorial of His creative power. Now, think about this for a second. A weekly reminder of the Creator God of the universe. Now, I want you to notice something interesting about this day. When you fast forward in the Bible to chapter 20 of Exodus, and we begin with verse 8, we find that this verse begins with a very interesting word. Remember. Now, by the way, this is the fourth commandment. And by the way, the seventh day, Sabbath, was put in place before there was ever a Jew. There were only two beings on this planet that had a will, and that was Adam and Eve. The first full day that they had together since they were created on the sixth day was the seventh day. In fact, that was the first day of their honeymoon. But in Exodus 20 and verse 8, it says, remember. Now, I can remember growing up and my mom would send me to the store and she would follow me out to the car. I didn't really want to go to the store, but I wanted to drive the car. And she'd follow me out, and the whole time, remember now, remember, be careful, remember to turn your signals, uh, remember to do this, remember to do that, and don't forget to, you know, remember. When somebody says remember something, they're concerned that maybe you might forget it. So written by the finger of God, he wrote, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. In verse 9 it says, Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work. 
And then in verse 11, it tells us why. It reminds us, it takes us back in time to the very creation of this world. In Exodus 20, verse 11, it says, For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and notice this, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day, and he hallowed it. Now let's stop for a second. Can you imagine today, if, if we were to keep the seventh day holy, the way God has asked us to do in the Bible, I think there'd be a lot, a lot of uh, problems that would be solved. Less stress, anxiety, and so forth. In fact, the high cost of forgetting in our society today reveals itself in a lack of meaning in life. For many, there's an identity crisis, a loss of self-esteem. There's evolution, evolutionists, skeptics, and agnostics on this planet. I believe there's a high price to pay for forgetting the day that the, that the Creator has set up as a memorial in time. It cannot be changed. It's etched in the fabric of the creation week. Now, let's go into the New Testament for a second. Mark chapter 2 and verse 27. I've heard some people say, but you know, Steve, the Sabbath is for the Jews. Ladies and gentlemen, that's not what the Bible says. It was not only for the Jews. Notice, the Sabbath was made for man, and not man for the Sabbath. If you were to look this word man up in the original language, you would find that it's mankind. Ezekiel 20 and verse 12. Moreover, I gave them my Sabbath to be a sign between them and me that they might know that I am the Lord who sanctifies them. Now that's interesting. Sanctification, setting apart for holy use. The Sabbath is a weekly reminder, ladies and gentlemen, of not only the Creator God, but His ability and His power to change and transform our lives. His ability to sanctify us, to make us holy through His Word and through the power of His Holy Spirit. That is awesome. Now some of you are wondering right now, which day of the week is the Sabbath? You probably expect me just to say it. I'd rather let the Bible explain it, and I believe that's exactly what you want tonight. You want to know what the Bible has to say about this. So, let's look at Luke chapter 23 and verse 54. We're going to look at several verses here. Let's go to the cross. That day was the preparation, and the Sabbath drew on. Now, Jesus was hanging on the cross on this day. He dies. He's taken from the cross. And he's placed in the sepulcher. In Luke 23 and verse 55, notice... And the women who came with him from Galilee followed after, and they observed the tomb and how his body was laid. So the, the rock that covered the door was open, and they could see Jesus laying in that tomb. They hastened back, according to verse 56. They returned and prepared spices and fragrant oils, and they rested on the Sabbath day according to the commandments. Many people today call the day that Christ was crucified Good Friday. The Bible says that on that day they came, they saw his body, they went back, and they rested on the Sabbath. 
Now, notice with me chapter 24, verse 1. That's Luke 24, verse 1. Now, on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and certain other women with them came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared. You say, okay, Steve, I, I see a Friday, I see the Sabbath, and I see the first day of the week. Let's review the order of events. Friday is the preparation day. That was the day that Christ died. Saturday would be the Sabbath day. And isn't it interesting that he rested in the tomb on that day? And then on the first day of the week, which is known as Sunday, he came forth from the tomb on the first day of the week. Now this is interesting. Some folks say, but Steve, after the death of Christ... We observe Sunday because of the resurrection of Jesus. Now, my friends, there's nowhere in the Bible that says we should do that. In fact, the ceremony that represents the resurrection of Jesus is the beautiful ceremony of baptism. Death to self, burial under the water, and the resurrection to the newness of life. Now let's go to Luke chapter 4 and verse 16. Speaking of Jesus, as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And then we go to Matthew chapter 12 and verse 12. Very interesting text. Jesus himself said, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Now, a careful study of the New Testament reveals, especially Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the four Gospels, you will notice that Jesus did some of his greatest miracles on the Sabbath. Now, I've heard some folks say, but you know, Steve, Jesus really didn't keep the Sabbath. And I want to agree with you on that point at least in a limited way. You say, well, what do you mean? Jesus did not keep the Sabbath the way the Pharisees said to keep it. He kept it the way the Bible says to keep it. And by the way, don't forget, He is the great Creator. He made it in the very beginning. He rested on it in the very beginning. And then He becomes the God-man. So Jesus said it was lawful to do good on the Sabbath. You see, the Jewish people, especially um, the Pharisees and, and, and priests and so forth, had made up all kinds of rules and regulations about the Sabbath. They made it such a burden. Jesus came to dust off all of that tradition and to show us the joy of keeping the Sabbath, to do good on the Sabbath. And Jesus gave us an example in what to do, ladies and gentlemen. Now I want to pause here for just a second. Who do you want to follow? When I first became a Christian, I had a decision to make. There are all kinds of people wanting to study the Bible with me. And I realized early on that I needed to study the Bible for myself. And as I studied the Bible for myself, I began to see a picture emerging of Jesus. And I vowed in my heart years ago that I was going to make Jesus my significant other. You say, but Steve, your wife is your significant other. My wife, Connie, comes behind Jesus, not before Jesus. I'm going to do what Jesus asked me to do, and I want to do what Jesus did. What about you, ladies and gentlemen? Do you want to do what Jesus has done? Do you want to do what Jesus is asking you to do? You know, sometimes we get caught up in tradition, and we find ourselves being swayed by people or churches or theologians, you name it. But at the end of the day, ladies and gentlemen, the bottom line is what does Jesus say in His Word? What did Jesus do? 
Remember when it was really popular to wear the little bracelet? You know, what would Jesus do? Ladies and gentlemen, it's always safe to seek the face of Jesus in every area of our spiritual life. So again, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Now let's go to Matthew chapter 24 and verse 20. Remember, this is the apocalyptic presentation of Jesus. It's based off the book of Daniel. It gives us insights, ladies and gentlemen, into the end times. Now, Jesus is talking to his disciples, and they're discussing events that would transpire in the future. In fact, Jesus is looking into the future some 40 years. And he knows that the destruction of Jerusalem would happen. And he says to his disciples, and pray that your flight be not in the winter or on the Sabbath day. Now, let's think about that for just a second. Why would Jesus say that to his disciples? He knew that he was going to die, be buried, resurrected, go back to heaven, glorified. That Pentecost would take place, the great outpouring of the Holy Spirit would take place. That the message would go to the Gentiles and a Gentile church with the Jews that were converted to Christ would grow. But as Jesus looked into the future, he saw the Roman soldiers surrounding the city. He knew that in 70 AD, the Titus with his soldiers, unfortunately, would burn the city to the ground. Now, ladies and gentlemen, Jesus predicted after his cross, after his death, after his resurrection, after his ascension, after Pentecost, after all of these things, ladies and gentlemen, Jesus made it clear that they would still be keeping the seventh day, Sabbath. Now let's go through the New Testament. Let's see what that New Testament church did. In Acts chapter 17 and verse 1, they came to Thessalonica where there was a synagogue of the Jews. Now you say, well, Steve, the Jews kept the seventh day Saturday. In fact, many of them still do today. But I want you to think for a second, nothing against the Jewish people. But what good is the Sabbath without Jesus? You have to think like that. What good is the Sabbath without Jesus? Now, in verse 2 of the same chapter, we find that Paul's custom was he went into them and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the Scriptures. Now, this is after the resurrection of Christ, obviously. And Paul is keeping the Sabbath. And Paul had turned his back on all his pharisaical ways. Paul had become a new creature in Christ Jesus. And surely, if the day of worship had been changed from the seventh to the first, of all people, the apostle Paul would know. Now notice Acts 13 and verse 42. We find that the Gentiles begin to beg that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. Isn't that interesting? New Testament. We find that the Gentiles are gathering together on the Sabbath to hear the word of God being presented to them. And then in Acts chapter 13 and verse 44, it speaks about the Sabbath again. And almost the whole city, the verse says, came together to hear the word of God. Amazing. In Acts 16, 13, on the Sabbath day, we went out of the city to the riverside where prayer was customarily made and we sat down and we spoke to the women who met there. Wow. 
How awesome. Beautiful. Now, some folks say, but Steve, Revelation 1.10. Revelation 1.10. John says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. This is a beautiful verse. And I can imagine the joy that John was experiencing. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. Now, it doesn't say what day it says the Lord's day. It doesn't say Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. It doesn't say. It only says the Lord's day. Now, we could guess. We could speculate. We, we could endeavor to, you know, put a day of the week to that. But would that be safe, ladies and gentlemen? I think it's safer for us to take our Bibles and compare Scripture with Scripture and see what the Bible has to say about this subject. So, in Matthew 12, 8, we'll compare that to Revelation 1, 10. For the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Now that's interesting. In Mark 2, 28, Therefore the Son of Man is also Lord of the Sabbath. In Luke 6, 5, The Son of Man is also Lord of the Sabbath. Matthew, Mark, Luke, three of the Gospels. It is crystal clear, ladies and gentlemen, that the Lord's day is the seventh day, is the Sabbath. Now it's interesting, the Sabbath of the Creator God in Genesis is the Lord's Day of Revelation. Way down here in the last few moments of earth's history, ladies and gentlemen, God has asked us to keep His day holy. Now you might say, Steve, I keep every day holy. Well, let's think about that for a second. My question is, can we keep a day holy that God has not made holy? What do you think? Well, I don't think we can find anywhere in the Bible that God requires us to keep a day holy that He has not made holy. Now, we are to be holy to God every day. We are to surrender our lives to Him every day. We are to be, like Paul said, dying daily, renewing our experience with Him each and every day. But ladies and gentlemen, the Lord at the very creation of the world created that seven-day weekly cycle, and the seventh day, He said, this is my day of rest. It is the Lord's Day of Revelation 1.10. Now, I know what some folks are thinking, and they sincerely mean this. What does it really matter, Steve, as long as I take one out of seven? As long as I take one. Now, keep in mind, God said the seventh day. Now, let's just say, for illustration's sake, we have seven lovely ladies up here, and number seven is my wife. Would it really matter, Casey? Would it really matter which woman I went home with tonight? Of course it would. I better go home with number seven, Connie, the one that I've been married to for 42 years. She's my wife. She's the one that I'm in the covenant relationship with. Now, somebody might argue, well, as long as you just take one and not all of them, it's okay. No, it's not, and you know better. So you see, ladies and gentlemen, we need to take the day that God has set. Not what we think. Even as sincere as we are, we need to listen to the Word of God. Now, here's a picture of God's end-time people. His last day people. We've looked at this before in Revelation 14, 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. 
we found in an earlier presentation, ladies and gentlemen, that two characteristics that really stand out for those that will meet Christ in the air when he comes back again. They keep the commandments of God through a grace-saved relationship with Jesus. Now, you notice that the first angel's message speaks of the everlasting gospel, it speaks of judgment, it speaks of getting, giving glory to God, and it also speaks of worshiping the Creator. In fact, in Revelation 14, 7, that part of the verse that says, Worship Him who made heaven and earth, the sea, and the springs of water, etc., etc., is taken directly from the fourth commandment, Exodus 20 and verse 11. Isn't that amazing? It's part of the first angel's message. And it's part of the everlasting gospel. Now, let me remind you. I know what some folks are thinking right now. You're thinking, well, Steve, we're saved by grace through faith. Remember, we talked about that last weekend. Absolutely. No question about it. We're not saved by works. We're not saved by keeping commandments. We keep the commandments of God because the love of God lives within our hearts. Because we're converted and we have a born-again experience with Christ. That's how we keep the commandments of God. We talked about the agape love being placed in the heart last week. It is impossible to keep any of the commandments, ladies and gentlemen, without Christ living in us the hope of glory. I don't want anyone going from this presentation tonight saying, Steve is teaching that we are saved by keeping the fourth commandment. No, we keep it because we are saved, not to be saved, just like all the commandments of God. We keep them because of a love relationship with Jesus. No other reason. You see, if we try to keep the letter of the law without the spirit of the law living within us, ladies and gentlemen, we'll be just like the Pharisees of old. We'll make rules and regulations and we'll be hard and harsh and we will miss the joy of that relationship with Jesus Christ. So I want you to know that this message tonight is all about Christ in his day, is it important to him? That's the major question we need to ask. Well, let's review. Let's look at a few things that we've seen so far. The Sabbath was given at creation. It was also written on the tables of stone by God's own finger at Mount Sinai. In fact, I'd like to submit to you tonight that it was Christ that wrote on those stones. Through time, God's people kept His Sabbath. Jesus, who created it and made it and wrote it on the tablets of stone, comes as the incarnate God-man, walks our dusty streets, heals the sick, raises the dead, opens the eyes of the blind, opens the ears of the deaf, kept the seventh day Sabbath. Oh, because he's a Jew? Ladies and gentlemen, Jesus was a Jew. No question about it. But he came to save all mankind. Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. That's what Jesus said. So ladies and gentlemen, it was given to all mankind. It was honored by the disciples. It's a sign of God's power to recreate. And by the way, it will be kept on the earth made new. You go, really? Yes. Notice what Isaiah says. In Isaiah 66 and verse 22. For as the new heavens and the new earth which I will make remain before me, says the Lord, so shall your descendants and your name remain. In verse 23. 
And it shall come to pass that from one new moon or one month to another, from one Sabbath to another, all flesh shall come to worship before me, says the Lord. You see, the Sabbath, ladies and gentlemen, will be kept in the earth made new. And you notice how the Sabbath is directly connected to worshiping God. That's why it's the part of the first angel's message there in Revelation chapter 14. So tonight as we close, I would like to encourage you to seriously pray about what we've talked about tonight. It's not so much what a pastor says, what Steve says, what a church says. It's what does the Bible say? What does Jesus say? And ladies and gentlemen, we must settle it tonight. I'd like for you just to make a little mental decision tonight that I want to follow Jesus and Jesus alone. Would you like to make that decision? Let's pray. Father in heaven, as we close tonight, we pray that you will guide us, that you will help us Make Jesus first and last, the Alpha and the Omega in our lives. That we will follow in the footsteps of Jesus. That we will follow the Creator. And Lord, I pray that you would give us the love in our hearts to experience the joy of keeping your Sabbath holy because we are saved. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Steve. That was incredibly thought-provoking, at least for me. And I know it called uh, me and, and all of us to decisions to make for Jesus and to follow Scripture. And so I thank you for that. Tomorrow's message as well, tomorrow's information promises to be equally as thought-provoking, if not more so, as Steve will talk to us about a prophecy in Scripture that is in Daniel and Revelation, about a power that threatens or at least thinks they can threaten God's law, a power that believes that they have the authority to change God's law. That is tomorrow at 11. And just as a reminder, we'll be back here, same website, tomorrow at 11, and then again at 7 p.m. So we'll be glad to see you twice tomorrow, and we're grateful you're spending your weekend with us here at Prophecies of Hope. And we look forward to continuing learning together. We'll see you tomorrow.